Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Nottinghamshire Healthcare uh, Board of Directors meeting. And uh, you're welcome if you're watching us live, or indeed if you're uh, watching this on the uh, the kind of the catch up version of the board meeting. My name is Paul Devlin, and I'm chair of the trust here. Uh, and I'm pleased to have you uh, along with us for today's meeting. Um, just a couple of uh, pieces about the way that we operate during this public meeting. Uh, as uh, as directors uh, seek to speak, they will uh, become visible uh, via their cameras. And whilst we are on Microsoft Teams, we just use the chat bar to indicate whether people have got comments or questions. Um, so there isn't a, a, a side conversation happening in the chat bar uh, whilst we're meeting in public. Um, so if I could just go to uh, a couple of pieces about uh, people who are on this particular uh, board meeting. We've had apologies from Steve Banks and from Sue Elcock, and um, uh, I'm pleased to say that Adele Fox is deputising um, for Sue, so a welcome to Adele. And also just to note that a couple of executive colleagues uh, will have to dip out at different points during the meeting uh, to respond to being on system wide uh, and uh, indeed national calls that relate to the pandemic. Uh, there are these various daily calls that we need to be able to be part of and um, uh, it's important that colleagues can uh, contribute to those and indeed make sure that we're getting the learning from those. Uh, so uh, I'll just check uh, Becky that uh, there weren't any other apologies that I hadn't noted. No further apologies. Thank you. Uh, and in terms of declarations of interest, can I ask anybody to indicate if they've got a declaration of interest in relation to any item on the public board meeting, please? And I'm not getting any indications. Thank you, colleagues. Um, so um, we haven't had any questions received in advance from the public. So we'll go straight to the minutes of our last meeting, uh, which was the November meeting. And um, first off, can I ask uh, whether or not uh, you can confirm that these are an accurate record of our meeting, please, colleagues? If you could just indicate for me um, if uh, with either a yes or a no. Thank you. Uh, so those those have been approved and just to confirm that actually from that last meeting uh, there weren't any specific matters arising for us uh, as actions out of that. I think there's um, uh, plenty of follow through on much of the work that we did talk about uh, that we will be getting further update on um, in uh, later parts of this meeting. So if we could move on to my report, um, obviously I'll, I'll take that as read. Just a couple of things that I wanted to say. Um, first of all, the, the last four weeks since we last met have been incredibly challenging for many of our uh, services um, and for our staff and not just in the professional lives but in their personal lives and I know as a board we would want to just pay tribute to all of our staff and volunteers um, as you continue to pro provide services through these incredibly challenging times. Um, I know that the pace is even harder than it was with the first wave uh, and I'm sure we'll be hearing more about some of the impact that that has been having on services as we go through the meeting today um, but just really wanted to underscore uh, our thanks to all of you um, for the continued superb efforts that you're putting in. Um, and uh, I also just wanted to note that today's board meeting uh, coincides with World AIDS Day. Um, it's something that I, I was reflecting on uh, having worked in the HIV world uh, some 35 years ago now. And I was just reflecting on um, the incredible impact science and medicine had around HIV. And I think we're seeing that again in terms of 
COVID-19 and um, indeed the pace uh, of the uh, scientific response around COVID-19 is in incredibly impressive. And again, I'm sure that there are things that we will hear about during this meeting that reflect on that. So I'll just pause there to see if there's anything anybody wanted to tease out from um, my uh, activity summary there. And if not, let's move on to the Chief Executive's report. John, if I could uh, invite you to introduce yourself. Thanks, Paul. Uh, morning, everybody. John Bruin, Chief Executive. Um, thank you. And the, the report's uh, a bit thinner than usual um, because it focuses largely around COVID. And I've just picked out some of the headline things that we're working on, happy to take uh, comments and questions at the end. On the first page, just to restate our position with national regulators, so with the Care Quality Commission, uh, we continue to do a lot of work around uh, our quality improvements, safety improvements um, and preparation for uh, when the CQC are able to restart their comprehensive inspections and visits. They are doing some nationally based uh, largely around um, risks and concerns um, that they ha may have with, with some trusts. Um, they flagged with us on a recent engagement call that um, when they do get back into an approved COVID safe methodology, we are um, fairly close to the top of their list for reinspection, but they've, they've stated that's from a positive position. And they're, they're, they're aware of so much work that many of our teams have been involved in, um, particularly in relation to safety, effectiveness, patient experience, that they're keen to um, to come back and, and make sure that their assessment of us is um, contemporaneous, if you like, that sort of matches where we are currently. Um, so that's a uh, work in progress. The other um, points around um, NHS England improvement on page one and two are, are a very sort of high level summary of where their main focus is at the moment um, nationally, re regionally and with us um, and it's largely around managing wave two. And it's largely centred on enabling NHS services to stay as open and accessible as possible. But people will be hearing, um, it, you know, across all the media that that's been a real challenge as, as the wave two has been quite extensive and certainly has hit Nottinghamshire and the East Midlands um, pretty hard. Um, and then I'll come on to talk a, a bit about um, in more detail when we talk about the trust, um, the, the where we are with staff testing um, and vaccinations, both of which are really um, good, good news. So uh, still on page two, a summary of uh, where we are with the Nottingham Integrated Care System, and the ICS. Um, and again, most of that work has been organisations working together to manage um, through the pandemic, whether that's um, sharing resources, mutual aid, helping each other out, sharing expertise. Um, and that's been really positive. I would say that organisations, including the CCG, the, the two acute trust ourselves, local authorities um, continue to look at how um, we can provide uh, the best services for, for our, our patients and citizens and also um, look after our, all our staff as, as well as we can. Um, from a trust perspective uh, on page two and page three, so to re-emphasise, we've now stepped up in what's called the ICT, the Incident Control Team. So that's uh, essentially a, a standing um, service that's based in the involvement centre at Duncan McMillan House um, and we have meetings daily which are supplied with vast amounts of information you know importantly from the clinical reference group the infection control team to um, make sure that we we stay on top of things uh, and that reports on a weekly basis to the executive team Two bits just to take a bit of time to to explain where we are. There's a lot of this um, in the media at the moment. So staff testing. On Monday, um, 
i.e. yesterday, we, we started to roll out what's called lateral, um, uh, lateral flow tests um, across all the organisation, essentially starting though with priority areas of, of our wards and crisis teams. At the moment, we haven't got enough to give everybody a lateral flow test um, at all at once. So this will be rolled out over the next couple of weeks. And as we get more supplies in, we'll, we'll roll it out across the organisation. And this enables staff to test themselves twice a week um, with a, uh, we think, a relatively easy system of reporting that result. It doesn't need to be sent off anywhere. Um, and there's, there's information if um, there's a positive test about what to do. Um, and that will give us, so I think, some real assurance about um, the, the COVID status of, of, of our staff. And we'll start to be able to tackle and get ahead of the game, particularly around the large numbers of people that um, are asymptomatic, so have no symptoms with, with COVID. And that's been one of, the, one of the reasons why it's so contagious, because it's spread throughout the population before you know um, you, you have it. So we think that, um, well, not just us, but the, the, the scientific evidence that this could be a real game changer for, for large organisations uh, and that enable us to get to get ahead of the curve. And the second thing to take a bit of time to, to bring everybody up to date on is the, um, the COVID vaccination. Again, lots of this in the media. Um, three of the, of the vaccines are currently with the um, medicines uh, and healthcare products regulations agency, the MHRA, and they will be the body that approves and and um, issues licenses for the use of these vaccines. Um, and that is expected any time over the next week or so. No vaccines can be given apart from in trials before that. But we are still um, preparing to uh, within the system within the county um, to commence um, vaccines I, um, from the middle of December. We haven't got an exact date. Um, it might slip again, depending on uh, dependent on the, the MRHA assessments. But um, the important thing about this is that they've been shown in, in fairly large trials to be uh, effective and to have a relatively low number of um, side effects. Um, so it's, it's a real positive step forward that once we can start to, to get the vaccinations out, again, it will enable us to get ahead of the virus and, um, uh, and, and control it to, to, to a degree that we've, we've had no armaments before now, apart from sort of various um, versions of the lockdown. So this is really positive news um, and we're approximating that as we move into the new year and early spring we'll be doing dozens of thousands of these um, across the population um, per week. The prioritisation um, will be that health and social care staff will be the first to, to receive the vaccines, which again is good news. It's made help and um, protect all our staff. Um, so some of the logistics um, challenges, particularly for the first couple of vaccines, which require ultra refrigeration, are proving a bit of a challenge. But again, there's 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 good plans in place across the system, and we are the coordinating provider for the the whole endeavour around vaccines for the ICS. So um, there's lots of people that uh, are working above and beyond in our organisation to help support that endeavour. Um, and as we move into the new year, um, I think we'll start to um, to see um, some massive improvements in in terms of rates of infections and uh, and outbreaks and things like that. Um, on on the last bit, there's, I've just put some bullets points there around some headlines of some of the other things that um, I'm happy to have a conversation about or or take questions on. There's nothing specifically um, else I wanted to add apart from um, in the. Um, in the analysis again just to um, this will be my last um, update of the calendar year to um, to thank everybody across the organization for the fantastic work they put in um, many many well all our staff have, have gone above and beyond um, working in really difficult 
environments um, with, also, with, you know, with the added uncertainty and challenge of um, all our own sort of family um, uh, and, and, and friends managing lockdown. Um, it's been a tremendous effort. I wanted to thank everybody for that and, um, and hope that people are, are able to take take some time out over the over the holiday season. It's really important that we all look after ourselves. Um, thanks very much, Paul. Back to you. Thank you, John. Um, so I'll just open that up to see if anybody's got any questions or comments um, for John. Um, I think it's uh, there's a, a good overview of the challenges that we face, but also some of the um, uh, potential lights that are uh, are coming forward for us um, and that obviously reflects across the whole of the uh, the country um, but even with those on their way I think it's really important to underscore the pressures that we've got at the moment. Okay I'm not seeing anybody indicating a need for anything further John so uh, let's move on to the next item which is the integrated performance report and Alison oh um, apologies Sue you've got a question there Sue can I invite you in? Uh, yes, thank you, Paul. My name is um, Sue Nixon. I'm one of the non-execs. Um, just a, a brief point, John, if I may. On the bullet points right at the very end, um, you've talked about an external accreditation of the quality network. Do you want to just expand on that? Because I think that's probably, you know, something we should applaud there. Yeah, thanks, Sue. Uh, yeah, so this is... Um, a sort of relaunch version of something that was that was previously called AIMS accreditation, which um, was a, a joint endeavour with the Royal College of Psychiatrists, which um, did, did a, a quality peer review using um, a, a, a validated methodology, um, particularly around um, inpatient wards, specialist inpatient wards. They all had different acronyms crisis teams and also laterally into community mental health teams. Um, this quality network um, is the next version of that. And um, we launched it, well, um, Mental Health Services Division launched it last week um, with a really impressive um, mm -hmm. session. And the reason it's important because it's been shown that um, peer review is a really powerful way to both um, examine your, your your quality, but also to, to motivate and inspire to people to share good practice and improve. Um, and there's, there's also additional benefits, I think, in the future that um, if, if you it, it provides you with a sort of kite mark, if you like, so if you if you can evidence that you've got whether it's QNWA or other related ones, then other quality regulators will take that as a sort of a, a badge of accreditation and you know, it, looking at it from a positive perspective might mean that for example the CQC will not need to repeat that because they'll take it as a um, that you've sort of passed the, the exam already so um, I think it's a really important endeavour for us to um, to roll out um, as, as, as we get used to using it across a, a broader range of, of teams and services. I don't know whether Julie um, actually wants to add anything because it's at the moment it's largely her teams. Judy's not indicating she's got anything to add, I don't think. Uh, Sue, did you want to just respond to that? And, and I, uh, well, um, thank you very much for that, John. I was mindful of that from some things that have been raised at Policy Committee, but actually I thought it was a really good piece of, of work that we should acknowledge despite all the other issues that are going on during COVID. So I think well done to everybody. And could I just add my thanks? Uh, I know you've you've um, said thanks to all the staff, given all the scenarios that everybody is facing and the challenges. I'm sure my col other colleagues on the board would, would echo those same comments. So thank you to you and your team and all members of staff and those people that we partner with, of course, as well. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Sue. Just, just to come back on that. I think Sue makes a really good point that um, whilst we may probably be spend a lot of this meeting talking about COVID and related things, it's important that we don't lose the thread on some other really important activities um, that that are core to what we do. And I think, I think this is a really good example of that. 
Great. Well, thanks. Thanks for flagging that with us, Sue. Um, so let's then move on uh, to the integrated performance report. Alison, you're the steerer through this one, so if you could uh, introduce yourself and the item, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Alison Wilde, Interim Director of Finance, here to present the integrated integrated performance report for October 2020. Um, I'll pick out a few areas of highlights in terms of areas of concern or improvement, then I'll pass over to my um, exec colleagues to, to pick out to give some more detail on their particular areas. In terms of mental health services, we've got an increase of um, out of area placements at month seven. We're above target at 162 against a target of 99. Um, largely due to um, the COVID and I think that's the same way in terms of all performance across the trust. COVID is having an impact on, on all our performance. Um, we have got uh, mental health long term plan waiting time standards for month seven have been achieved. Uh, despite COVID for early intervention psychosis and children and young people eating disorder services. In terms of um, community health services, we've got lower than um, usual levels of occupancy, uh, particularly at John Eastwood Hospice, we've only got 42% and it reflects the impact of COVID again. Um, the number of patients who waited over 13 weeks for treatment has continued to increase from 126 to 162 at month seven, and that's 6% of all patients by community health services, so areas of concern. In terms of forensic services, occupancy is below target, but within expected levels in high secure and continues to fall in low secure services. Um, in ter terms of quality, um, we have had our first uh, never event for over three years um, where it's been classed as a failure, where there was a, an incident where there was a failure to install functional clouds, build shower or curtain rails. And I'm sure Anne Maria, um, our executive director of nursing, will go into that a little bit more when I introduce her. Her workforce overview, John's talked about COVID outbreaks and staff testing, so I won't go over that again, but just to highlight that sickness is, is Morning, um, Julie Atfield, Director of Local Mental Health Services. As Alison has suggested, um, out of area is as we had predicted, mainly affected by cohorting and outbreaks. Um, we don't believe that we are an outlier when compared to other organisations and I've seen some data for other trusts actually that's markedly higher. So. Um, that has abated in, in the last week or so, but to, it's obviously still a challenge. Um, in terms of the perinatal um, national target, unfortunately, I don't expect this to recover in this, in this, fi well, in this financial year. Um, I am in discussions with NHS England about um, alternative contacts, because this is based only on face-to-face -face contacts and lots of families are choosing um, other media, so um, we are pursuing that. Um, the two ED breaches, that's emergency department breaches, um, is quite unusual, unusual for us. One was related to um, a period when the mother and baby unit was closed to um, admissions due to an outbreak, and the other was um, quite a long time before we had the referral made to us. Um, there are some positive developments though in, in this sphere because um, we're advised by the local authority that they are in discussions about moving to a 24-7 um, AMP service. So that's really good because it means that out of hours they won't be relying on their on their um, emergency duty team for out of hours mental health assessment. So that's really, really positive. Um, I just wanted to flag some things around weight because you don't always get um, the detail in, in the report. Um, there's some sort of winners and some losers in this. Um, we have managed 
the board will remember that we had quite a discussion probably about nine months ago in terms of memory assessment services and following some investment into that services. We've managed to cut the waiting times by 48 days um, since July, so that's a very positive shift. And actually waiting for assessment in local mental health teams is half, there are half the number of patients that were waiting in January. Um, more challenging though um, are waits within CAM services where we've got an average 10 week wait for assessments. Um, so we're going to try and shift some resources around there and we are in discussion with commissioners obviously about demand outstripping capacity. Um, pleasingly though, there aren't long waits for treatment, but there are um, around assessment. So that's that's my update. And just before I open it up for questions, um, you snuck in an acronym there, Julie, uh, AMP. Just... Yeah, a, a, a approved mental health practitioner, that's under the Act. The Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so just see if anybody's got any questions or comments uh, for Julie on that summary piece, please. Uh, John, invite you in. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Uh, just to um, add, add to Julie's point about um, access weights, particularly for children, young people, that it's um, as as Julie's described, it, it's it's really challenging in terms of um, the pressures, but it, it's um, not that this is an excuse, but it's a regional and it's a national problem. Um, so on the the fortnightly calls with the national team giving updates, um, the, the there's there's been a, a tremendous um, and ongoing increasing in um, in mental health concerns and, and problems in, in children and young people and it's putting a, a really um, amount of pressure on services to to adapt and to, to to manage it. One of the challenges is that um, some CAM services are um, in specialist trusts like ours can sometimes be a bit too specialist and there's a there's a lack of that sort of middle ground provision um, and again that's something we 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 you would constantly talking to commissioners about to make sure that um, it's, a, it's a bit of a cliche, but if you can get get to see people sooner, you, could, you can head off a lot of, uh, you know, longer term secondary and um, difficulties. So um, we, we've got some good conversations um, going uh, and we're hoping that people will be aware of some of the additional monies that were, that were promised at the, at the start of um, Last week, we'll we'll be able to um, secure some of that to to help these um, access to these sorts of services. Really important. Thanks. Thanks, John. That's that's helpful. Um, so I, I'm not seeing any other uh, questions or comments coming through. Thank you. So Alison, if we go back to you to steer us on to. The next yeah. piece. Yes, thank you, Paul. I'm just going to take the report slightly out of order because um, our exec director of community services has, has gone off to another meeting. So if I can come to forensic services next, please. And Adele. Hi, morning. Hi. In terms of high secure, um, as occupancy, um, I'm pleased to report that a significant piece of work has um, happened within high secure with NHSE and we have plans to admit patients all across the care streams within December and January. So we will see um, a difference uh, by the end of January with that occupancy in high secure. Um, for low secure, um, although the occupancy has dropped, um, it's because we've had quite a few discharges go all at once, but we do have uh, plenty of referrals coming in. So we'll see a difference within that within the next few months as well. Okay. Thanks, Adele. Thanks. Let's see if there's any uh, any commentary there. Um, uh, Alison, I invite you in and then Carolyn. Alison first, please. Uh, apologies, Paul. It's the next one. I, I haven't got the titles at the top, so it's it's actually clear I've got my question for. So apologies. OK, turn over. no worry. Uh, Carolyn, are you on this one? I am. Thank you. Yes. Um, Carolyn White, non-exec director. Good morning, Adele. Thank you. Um, it was just the um, the comment in the narrative there about the two 
um, female patients waiting for forensic services. And I just wonder, and, and it, it makes reference to COVID, but I, given the lower um, uh, occupancy, I just wondered what, what specifically the delays were for, for those patients. OK, so we had um, an outbreak in with the women's services for COVID, so we were unable to admit uh, people um, for the last, we were unable to admit anybody until the 28 days clear, it were clear. Um, our first patient on that waiting list will be admitted on the 11th of this month. Um, so once we're away, away from that outbreak, then we'll be able to start to admit people again. And then we've got another one in January. Thanks, Adele. And just <coughs> so I'm clear, are those patients currently in health? Um, provision. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, uh, and Manjit, if I can invite you in, please. Thank you, Manjit Darby. I'm one of the new non-exec directors um, in the organisation. Um, I've got a general question which relates to um, um, the there is a general view about harm as a result of COVID, um, people not accessing services. So linked in with lower occupancy, um, the reduction in numbers of patients that are actually getting out to hospital appointments, um, the increased waiting times for um, treatment. I just wondered whether there was a piece of work happening in the background on um, the impact um, on clinical outcomes for patients and also whether there was any active work on doing some uh, something about that. Do you, want to start, do you want to start on that Adele and then I'll see if there's any colleagues want to come in on that. Okay so we are asking feedback from patients about the, um, how this has impacted on them uh, personally. Um, for access to services as in, as in the acute trust, that, that hasn't changed for the forensic division. Um, and obviously as waiting list, we've been actively working on that. So we had a significant amount on the waiting list for mental health, but we reduced that even with COVID. So we have reduced uh, the waiting list uh, quite significantly within mental health services. So the access to our services has not been impacted on apart from the women's services. And I think uh, Julie, Julie H, if I can uh, invite you in, please, as well on that. Yeah, so just to confirm, as well as the work that the divisions are doing themselves, we are doing <clears throat> a piece trust wide through the medical directorate, particularly being supported by the public health resource that sits within my directorate. So both looking at harm and impact through delay, through access, but also looking within that at specific vulnerable groups and whether there's been disproportionate harm and trying to do that in such a way that we can put mitigation in now if possible so that we're not adding to it. That's linking into ICS work through the clinical reference group, looking at that on a system level as well. Thanks Julie. Manjit, did you want to respond to that? No, that's very helpful. I mean, I think that there's a lot of um, conversation about delays in treatment and impact um, and people's reluctance to come forward for um, support, particularly in the mental health arena. So um, it's really good that there is positive, proactive outreach work happening on this. So thank you. That's really helpful. Great. Thank you. Uh, Alison, I'll come back to you to steer us on, please. Thank you, Paul. Um, can I hand over to Anne Maria for a quality update, please? Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Amore Newham, I'm the Executive Director of Nursing, AHPs and Quality and it's my pleasure to um, introduce the quality section of our IPR and um, we talk, firstly we're talking about a never event. Alison did mention it in her introduction. These are really rare. The last one we had was in June 2017 um, and that was um, debatable as to whether or not it was a never event at the time. It was a removal of a tooth for a child. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that these are rare and this one relates to um, in mental health and forensic services you have to use collapsible shower and curtain rails so that patients can't um, harm themselves and they have to be able to collapse at a certain weight which is normally 40 kilograms um, and in this one case um, a patient was able to um, uh, put uh, material around a curtain rail 
and the curtain rail did for a very, very brief um, seconds hold uh, the patient's weight. Um, and again, so this is cast, classed as a never event. The patient didn't come to any harm, thankfully. Um, and we're currently doing a piece of work across the whole organisation to make sure that we've got the right um, rails and that they can all collapse at the um, level they're meant to. So that was just on that one. Let me just check that I've not got any questions on that. And then the next one we're talking about is in relation to safer staffing. And this is a really important area, as everybody can imagine. With regards to COVID, we've had um, extreme amounts of staff um, needing time off uh, from work, whether or not that's related directly to having COVID themselves or whether or not they've needed to self-isolate for track and trace reasons. But we have had some hotspot areas within the organisation. Um, and interestingly enough, um, some of our reporting is due to the fact that we've put um, staffing over and above what we would normally have because of the um, additional acuity of patients. And acuity means patients are poorlier, sicker and um, need more help and are more complex. Um, so these are the areas that we talk about when we talk about safer staffing levels. Um, so we're just highlighting then in that area around some of the work that we've done and we're making sure that we do regular establishment reviews as well to make sure that um, each of the wards have got the right staffing levels that are required for their areas. Um, and that's all I've got to report today. Thanks, Anne-Maria. Um, uh, Alison, can I invite you in with a question, please? Uh, yes, <coughs> thank you, Chair. Alison rose Query. I'm one of the non-exec directors. Uh, thank you, um, Anna Maria, for your uh, report. I I'm coming back to the Never event. Um, yeah. Appreciate that uh, you're obviously having a look across the board in in all the services now at the at the curtain rails. But my my question is more about the the checking of the curtain rails up to now, and and, and it obviously wasn't robust enough because one has one has failed the the test. And, and what are we doing about making sure that once we've checked them all and we think they're all right, that there is regular testing? Thank you, Alison. So I can say that there is regular testing. It's not that we weren't doing the regular testing before. There is regular testing and that's done by our states and facilities teams. Um, and actually, interestingly enough, when we when we went and checked that exact rail, it did collapse. So um, there's more work to be done as to why it didn't collapse in that one occasion. But on that exact rail, it did collapse um, two days later when it was rechecked. Um, and also what we're finding is, is that uh, we're working with the company themselves, Gliss Rails. So we're working with the company themselves to ensure that um, this hasn't occurred anywhere else because there's also learning for other organisations as well to make sure that we learn across the NHS. So um, we do test them. We test them on a regular basis. Um, and also um, uh, we risk assess as well, dependent on what areas those rails are in on, on our tr trust. OK, all right, thank you. And uh, I think that that shared learning is really important. I certainly know of an, uh, a, another trust that in uh, the recent couple of months has had uh, what sounds like a pretty similar uh, mm. never never event uh, and um, I know Anne Maria that you do obviously share information about never events uh, with colleagues across the country. Absolutely. Uh, okay I'm not seeing any other further questions uh, so Alison back to you please. Thank you um, the next section is workforce so can I hand you over to Claire Tierney um, to cover workforce issues. Thank you. Hi, um, morning everybody. Um, as I said, my name is Claire Tini. I'm Director of People and Culture here at Knott's Healthcare. I think um, colleagues have pretty much covered off um, some of the points that I would highlight. Just to reiterate though around um, staff uh, absence and um, we've, you know, we have seen over the last few months an increase and an impact on workforce capacity due to people being off largely due to COVID reasons. I think one of the things that I would say is that um, into the, the performance report this month and in terms of the, the latest figures, we are seeing the COVID absences reduce and actually the non-COVID sickness absence is the, the thing that's, that's increasing slightly. Um, there's a few things for us that as John has indicated, will help in terms of the management of COVID absence. One is the rollout of mass um, lateral flow testing regularly for all of our staff. 
what we feel that that will also help with is it's cough and cold season. So for people who may be off with suspected COVID symptoms that are not COVID, that's where also the lateral flow testing will help manage um, that and support that. So that will be useful. In terms of uh, voluntary turnover, we've seen a sustained reduction um, in that across the board, which is good. And the other thing that is good to see is that whilst our um, staff appraisals are still not um, above our target, that is a predicted underperformance because we did slow up on some of those earlier in the year. But actually, um, the number of appraisals that have been completed is higher than what we'd actually anticipated and expected, given the fact that we did pause some of that, that activity. Um, I'll, st I'll stop there because I think other things have been covered off um, in case anyone's got any questions. Thank you, Claire. Um, if I could start with uh, Umar, please, if you could like to introduce yourself, Umar. Hi, good morning, uh, everybody. My name's uh, Umar Zaman. I'm uh, one of the new non-executive directors. Uh, hi, Claire. Just uh, a quick question around uh, the sickness. Um, and it's good to know that we've got, uh, a, you know, a reduction in the COVID uh, related uh, illnesses. Could, could you just expand and just tell me what, 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 what are the other areas that are increasing um, it, and, and is any of it related to stress um, and, and anxiety levels? Thank you. Thanks, Umar. So um, for non-COVID sickness absence, um, both during the last few months of the pandemic and prior to that, and um, the top reason for sickness absence has been stress and anxiety. Um, we've not seen that go up particularly um, because of COVID in the last few months, but it is something that we are watching. And one of the other key reasons for absence is um, uh, musculoskeletal. Um, and they've not changed during the last few months. They were the top reasons prior as well. Do you want to come back on that, Uma? Yeah, that, that's great. Thank you, Claire. I just, uh, and just one follow up question, actually. Um, in terms of sickness levels, um, both related to COVID and non-COVID, um, are, are we monitoring kind of the makeup of our staff? Are women, uh, for example, disproportionately impacted? Uh, people with disabilities uh, that are that we that we have known disabilities being impacted by this. And is there anything in particular we're doing around providing support to those? Um, I've I've had a look at the the well-being stuff, and it's great. It's got some fantastic stuff happening. Um, it's normally those people that slip through the, the net. Um, so is there anything specific that you could tell me about that, please, Claire? Thanks. Um, yeah, sure. So um, so just in, in terms of response to the, the question, for all of our staff, everyone has been offered a um, risk assessment and there's been a high take up of, of that. And we've also conducted detailed risk assessments for um, colleagues who have uh, known disabilities, other, uh, other underlying health conditions and vulnerabilities and for BME members of staff. Um, so we've got quite a lot of information about then the specific support and onward actions and adjustments that colleagues uh, then need and those have been put into place well managed and well supported particularly by the health and well-being team which was set up in April coincidentally actually because we were due to set that up based on the work that we'd done last year but it was timely in terms of being in place and up and running to help support and manage through the pandemic so um, and a huge thank you to colleagues who've done that work in terms of just some of the absence data and trends for those staff that are shielding and have been um, shielding throughout um, and have been supported to continue to work where they can, those colleagues do uh, generally have um, known disabilities that are classed as disabilities under the under the relevant legislation. And again, we've supported those with, with adjustments and support. And in terms of, of absence overall, the trends that we have noticed and that we are working through is that for a non-COVID related sickness absence, there isn't any, any particular differential around some of our staff groups, whether that be gender um, or around ethnicity. For people that are off and have been off with COVID related sickness absence, there has been a higher impact on BME members of staff as opposed to non-BME members of staff. And we'll, we work all of that through with, with the individuals um, concerned. So, so that is one of the trends that has been picked up and supported. 
Thanks, Claire. Umar, uh, any, any response to that? No, that, thank you for that, Claire. That, that's really helpful and good to know that we've, uh, we're, we're, we're on top of that. Uh, I think one of the just final point I would say is that I think there's just something around communicating that good news story that we are doing that. Um, you know, I think there's something around trust and confidence with specifically those minority staff that have been impacted by COVID and disproportionately uh, those particular groups that have. And I think, um, you know, the trust are doing a fantastic job and we need to make sure that we are letting our staff and people know what we're doing about that. Thanks, Umar. That's a, a, a good call there. Uh, Alison, if I could go to you, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Claire, for, for the report. Um, just a quick question of clarification from me. We're, on the total turnover, this has obviously gone up uh, worryingly high, but you, you say it's due to the movement of the Children's Centre on the 31st of May. Do you know what the underlying figure is? So if you exclude the exceptional figures that are around the Children's Centre, what's the underlying trend in terms of turnover? Thanks, Alison. So, um, so what we call voluntary turnover, i.e. people who can choose to leave as opposed to leaving because we've had a transfer and a move of services. Our voluntary turnover has continued to go down. So there's a there's a there's a downward trend in that, which is good. And it's brought within our what we call our accepted tolerance of between nine and 11 percent. I think it's currently at around 10.3 percent um, so we've seen a sustained reduction in terms of people choosing to leave the organization and that was that was actually something that we'd worked on over the last um, 12 to 18 months to try and address that particularly people who um, we've, we'd found were leaving us within the first 12 months so we've managed to to steady that up which I think is is good okay thank you uh, and uh, across to Manjit please Manjit Thank you, um, Manjit Darby, non-exec director. Um, I just got two questions. The first was, um, uh, firstly, the report's very helpful, so thank you for that. Um, my question was about the, the impact of lateral flow testing. Given our sickness rates are going up, um, what's the modelling just in terms of what you expect to see in terms of prevalence through lateral flow testing and um, uh, what you expect that to do in terms of absence rates? Claire, that was my first question, please. Thanks, Manjit. So, so actually, as, as these tests have been piloted and trialled um, elsewhere, we've got a, a much better indication, actually. So um, to start with, we were, we were being told to expect around 6 to 7% actually has that's been worked through um, and there's been more trials both at a population level and within other NHS organisations it's nearer to, to one percent or just over so that's what we're currently anticipating and working to. Great that's really helpful thank you and then my second question was just testing the um, um, assumptions that sit behind voluntary turnover um, because Whilst there's a reducing trend, um, just looking at the, um, the, the the graph, I'm just wondering how it's been tested internally in the organisation, given the it coincides with the impact of COVID. And is it a reluctance for people to move because of the uh, what's happening with COVID, or is it a genuine um, we really want to stay in this organisation? Just wondered how that had been tested. So thanks. So um, I think it's fair to say that COVID will have had an impact because we're seeing a reduction in turnover um, across across the NHS. Mm. However, um, we had, you know, we had started to see a bit of a downward trend. And I, I, I mentioned earlier that the biggest impact on our voluntary turnover, certainly if I roll back over the last three years, has been where people have left us within the first six to 12 months. Um, and we'd started two years ago to do quite a lot of work around that. So improving induction, orientation, making sure that where we needed to move staff, that wasn't for new starters, so they got stability in teams. And actually we've seen that slow up um, over a sustained period of time. So whilst COVID has had an impact, we've also got a level of confidence that the data is correlating with some of the work that we put in place um, prior to, uh, you know, sort of a, a reasonable period before the pandemic. So we're hopeful, well, we, we can say actually that, um, that that is also a factor. Great, lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Great. 
Thanks, um, Alison. I'm going to come back to you to um, steer us on. I don't know if you want to do your your section next and then see Thank uh, you. if yeah. Becky or John can pick up the community. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Yes, Alison Wilde, Interim Director of Finance. Uh, just an update on the finances as at month seven. Um, the previous, as a result of COVID from months one to six, NHS improvement, England and improvement actually um, gave trusts enough income to cover their expenditure in that first six months so they gave us a top up to ensure that we broke even we were anticipating that continuing um, but we were notified in month six that there was an expectation that we would break even without the top up payment from NHSEI as a result of that, the Nottinghamshire Integrated Care System, um, with ourselves as part of that, um, submitted a plan nationally, which was a deficit plan, of which our deficit was is anticipated to be 6.1 million um, at the end of this financial year. This wasn't as a result of um, changing financial performance, it was a result of loss of income um, to cover our costs. So we are working very closely now with our Nottinghamshire uh, provider and commissioner colleagues to actually review that deficit and do everything we can as a system. And we are working weekly with regulators to, to, to address those underlying, so some are underlying baseline issues and other things are costs, higher costs as a result of COVID. So just, um, as an overview, we are still anticipating 6.1 million deficit, but optimistic in terms of conversations that we're having with our national and regional commissioners that that deficit will reduce by the year end. But I will continue to report that to board going forward. Um, and that's it in terms of the finances. Has anybody got any questions? Let's see if anybody's got any questions on the financial piece. OK, I'm not seeing any. So, Alison, do you want to steer us again? Thank you. Um, in the absence of Becky, I'm going to hand over to John Bruin, our chief, chief executive, to go through community health services update. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Alison. Um, that, I mean, if there are detailed questions on this, I think we will have to wait for Becky to come back. But to just to go through the two sort of headlines of those charts on John Eastwood Hospice and um, the, the community waits for, for treatment. But I think the, the John Eastwood Hospice is fairly self-explanatory in terms of the reduction in occupancy um, that followed a steady decrease from the onset of the pandemic back in February and March. Um, and the commentary there identifies that people not wanting to, to come into um, inpatient facilities, the, the concerns about um, contracting COVID um, and the, the drop off in, in in referrals. And then that was um, in addition, the, the, the hospice itself had to, had to close to admissions for a while because of a COVID outbreak um, in the hospice itself. Um, and the commentary at the end suggests that um, after October that referrals have started to, to increase again. The um, the the weights the breaches of thirteen weeks for treatment I, I think is probably a combination of factors. There was um, again, if you look at the the months across the bottoms from the beginning of the the pandemic initially in March and April, there was a very significant rise. Um, I suspect that's probably due to a number of factors, not least that the the relative. Um, reduction in people's um, seeking referrals to other specialist um, services from their GPs and also there was a massive shutdown across all um, emergency departments and um, so our community teams got um, a relatively significant increase in referrals. There's a, ma a minor reduction through the holiday season but you can see that they're back up there again even before wave two hit. And so I think it's a combination of increased referrals and the challenges that our teams have had in terms of um, staff absences have all contributed to this. Um, apart from that, I wouldn't be able to give any more detail. And um, if there are, like I say, that we might need to wait for Becky to, to, to pick that up. 
OK, thanks. Thanks for that, John. I think mean, that's that's helpful um, to, to, to give us a bit of a steer on that one. Um, and if colleagues have specific uh, questions, uh, let's pick them up when when Beck is back with us. So um, Alison, thank you for that steer through um, uh, of the whole of the integrated performance report. Um, and let's move on to uh, our next item, the board assurance framework. We call it the BAF and the risk register update. Uh, John, I think, uh, 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 Shirley, are you presenting this? You're on mute, Shirley. John was going to present it, but I'm happy to lead it. Um, Great. If that's OK. Um, so here is the BAF. It's still a revised, it's a revised BAF and it reflects all the work that board execs have done over recent months. Um, still some work to do on it. Um, but you can see that it, it is getting there, it is getting populated and there's been lots of work by the execs to complete it. Versions of this have been to the committees, F&P committee and people committee and finance and performance committee, audit committee. Um, so they are aware and they have had input into this. Um, it's very important that the board own this though. Um, so when it's completed and comes back in January, um, hopefully the committee section at the end, the assurance rating will be completed. Um, because what happens is this goes to committee and the committees then provide their level of assurance um, so that the board can be assured. Um, so really that's all I've got to say unless there are any specific questions. The items that are highlighted in blue are because we need to do a revised risk management strategy so we can't really complete those until we've had that agreed, but that's potentially what it will look like. Thanks very much, Shirley. Uh, Alison, do you want to go first? Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, Shirley. Uh, and this is coming together very nicely. I know it's taking an awful lot of work and it's, it's very complicated, but it, it is actually looking a lot better than the one we had before. So, so well done and, and we're almost there. My, my only, it's not a question, it's a comment really. On the board assurance framework summary, for me, and it, it's a personal, it's a personal comment. I think it would be helpful if you actually have the link to the committees on there as well, so we okay. knew which one was going to the committees, and then you can see it, everything you need to know in one place. And if you're on a committee, that points you to where you need to focus. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. We'll do that. Thanks, Alison. Uh, Stephen, if I could come to you, please. Uh, Again, I think this is more of a, a, a comment than it than it is a, a, a question, Chair. Um, thank you. I, I, I should say I'm Stephen Jackson, non-executive director and chair of the audit committee. Um, uh, just to um, you know, to add the further assurance that uh, we, we've 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 um, we've we've looked at this in the committees, both at audit and in finance, in 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 my particular case. And uh, I'd just like to underline what Shirley was saying that that we you know whilst we're we're, we're not at the end of um, of, of this uh, quite yet, we are making really good progress. Thank you, uh, Manjit. To you, please. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to understand the role of users and carers in the development of the board assurance framework and whether they play a role in how that gets played into this. Um, they haven't been uh, managed in the development of this. They will be part of the assurance reports and risk primary risk controls that would go to committees and then the underpinning meetings under that. So it would all be about how the things were reported through to the BAP to give assurance. Okay. but not directly into this document. Yeah, I just wasn't clear about kind of the role that they play historically in the in the, in the board assurance framework development and um, structure. That's all. So yeah, it would be the independent um, meetings and groups that provide assurance through to yeah. the board assurance framework. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Carolyn, over to you, please. Thank you. Um, this is just to probably reiterate what Stephen has said. Uh, sorry, Carolyn White, non-exec director. The um, this draft of the board assurance framework has been to the People and Quality Committee uh, last week, um, and the, the committee were pleased around the progress. I think it is simplified but still comprehensive, um, and will make uh, use of, of the board assurance framework uh, much more straightforward as as it develops. 
Thanks, thanks, Carolyn. Um, and um, Shirley, one of the things that I, I particularly noted was that um, the, this iteration had developed in response to feedback you'd had from colleagues at the last board meeting, um, yeah. which is really helpful. Uh, and I think uh, I think demonstrates um, the, uh, the the focus that you and colleagues have brought to this, uh, and um, you know, us being able to have a board assurance framework that we can feel really confident in is important. And those comments from colleagues about the way that uh, it's been working with the board committees uh, are very encouraging. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm not seeing any other uh, comments or queries coming through on that. Now, um, just in terms of this, we're asked to um, uh, uh, assess whether or not this gives us assurance regarding this process. Um, so just give me an indication, colleagues, please, if you're feeling assured with the way that this process um, is, is moving along in terms of the board assurance framework and the way that both it is developing and the capture of the key elements within that. And I'm getting some yeses coming through on that. Thank you. That's that's appreciated. Thank you. Uh, so if we could move on then um, to uh, the next section, which is uh, reports from board committees. Uh, if we could start with strategy committee, and I think Sarah that you're going to introduce this one. Yes, thank you, Paul. I will. My name's Sarah Furley. I'm the Director of Partnerships. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm going to take the papers read and just tease out three areas. Firstly, we are um, in the process of developing a five year strategy for the trust. We did take the decision after the last strategy committee to slow down that development, not pause it, but slow it um, in order to reduce the ask um, on our frontline staff so they can focus on um, clinical services. The second thing is that the strategy committee received a um, lessons learnt report from wave one of COVID that was well received by the committee and we're now embedding that um, in this second wave. And then the third thing um, was the um, secure services provider collaborative just to report that we are on track for delivering a commissioning plan by the 14th of December and all partners have now signed the Memorandum of Understanding. Um, so just to conclude, there's nil to escalate to the board. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much. Um, I think that's a, a, a good clear summary for us, Sarah, and um, I'm not seeing any indications. I think, again, given, given that the committee hadn't identified items to escalate, I think we can receive that uh, and go to the People and Quality Committee highlight report. Carolyn, please. Thanks, Chair. Again, um, a, a straightforward report, which I assume people have read. Um, the things that I just would like to highlight are related to the annual quality report. The committee did have an extraordinary meeting and um, uh, considered this in depth at this uh, meeting that's reported here um, and is confident that it is a, a good reflection of the work of the trust during the uh, last 12 months. And also um, we agreed the quality priorities for the organisation going forward. Um, the other area I think of, of worth, worthy of highlight is the staff survey. We are really pleased to see the improvement um, in the response to the staff survey uh, this year and feel that this is a good reflection of the engagement work that's been going on across the organisation um, during the year. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, and again, uh, no items to escalate to the board there either. Uh, thank you. So if we could move to the extraordinary audit committee uh, report, please, Stephen. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, again, Stephen Jackson, non-executive director, chair of audit committee. Um, I, I should perhaps just say a word as to why it was an extraordinary meeting. I think the, um, uh, the around COVID, um, some of our meetings had got slightly out of sync 
and with all the work going on on the BAF, um, it was felt that we should we should put a um, an audit committee into the agenda to cover a single agenda item, which which was the uh, the progress on the BAF. I think I should also say by way of explanation that the audit committee does not uh, uh, specifically look at individual risks, but more uh, focuses on uh, the systems and processes that underpin um, uh, the BAF and and uh, a key role of the audit committee is to give uh, the board the assurance that those um, uh, processes and systems are working uh, well. Um, in this case, we got a, a really good update and, and I would say that it's also going along with um, the work of an executive group um, called the Risk Committee, where um, I'm allowed to attend as an observer to, uh, to, to, to see what's going on. And uh, what I would say is that the audit committee has seen, and I, I've seen in other places, um, the very good progress that we're making on the BAF. We saw that, you know, in two items ago on 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 the agenda from Shirley's report. And although we still have a way to go, um, the, um, uh, the the this is this uh, new process is being undertaken logically, um, and and professionally and uh, you know we're, we're getting very close to uh, to having something that would be really really helpful to us. Thanks very much Stephen uh, and again nothing highlighted to escalate. Um, so uh, if we could move to the finance and performance committee report please. Trevor if you'd like to introduce yourself. Sure good, good morning good morning chair um, Trevor Orman uh, finance and performance non-exec director and chair. Um, we held the finance and performance review last Thursday on the 26th of November, and we covered five specific categories to gain assurance for our financial uh, finance and performance assessment. So we covered the integrated uh, performance report, and this was to make sure we gained assurance on our internal regulatory uh, performance, which was assured, but we we will be carrying over a deep dive into 2021 on out of area beds. Um, secondly, we looked at the board assurance framework, uh, two specific areas, one on infrastructure to make sure we can meet our infrastructure commitments, and secondly, our risk against financial targets. And we were both assured, um, with the exception of the challenges that Alison's mentioned around the deficit plan, that our financial um, regulatory and performance controls were, were uh, in place and assured. We covered uh, the capital program for the investment plan for 2021 and we had the initial review of the Millbrook strategic outline business case and, and approved to go on to the next phase of, a, of an outline business case. And lastly, we looked at the long term plan, which is to make sure that our investment capability and our resourcing going forward meets our delivery and service requirements uh, for the future. And one area is that we we supported was the continued uh, effort to be put into recruitment at the pace that we are, which is slightly ahead of our initial plan. But because of that being a major issue in the marketplace, we were assured it was the right action um, to take. So um, all in all, it was a very good meeting. We, we had no exceptional items that we were concerned about. Um, and my final point would be just to say a huge thank you to Alison and the finance team for dealing with a very complicated structure of financial reporting within the NHS. And they do an exceptional job on bringing clarity to, um, uh, to our financial position and making sure that we keep in control and we're assured of our financial commitments. Uh, that's it for me, Chair, for financial Thanks. performance. Thanks very much for that, Trevor. Um, and uh, again, no items to uh, escalate. Um, so uh, I suggest uh, we move on to the Freedom to Speak Up Guardian report. And uh, Julie H, over to you, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Julie Hankin, Medical Director for the Trust. So this is our regular Freedom to Speak Up Guardian report. My apologies, normally this report would go for more detailed discussion at People and Quality before coming here, but as we've been in the process of moving into appointing our interim Freedom to Speak Up Guardian, we're slightly out of sync. So it's here first, but in future we'll go there. So I'm delighted to say that our interim Freedom to Speak Up Guardian, Simbi Sabanda, was appointed at competitive recruitment process 
and took up role on the 2nd of November. So Simbi is going to be doing the role as a secondment from her substantive role as a nurse at Wofford Hospital. She, for the moment, is focusing particularly on the champions infrastructure within the trust and how we both increase that support and train it. And we have 11 champions, I'm delighted to say, going through training tomorrow with Simbi and will be moving to being active in the trust. We did, the data is here in terms of concerns that have been raised over the year and the difference in quarters. We did see a significant drop in the last quarter during the period where we didn't have the interim in place and concerns were coming directly to me. Talking to NHSE and others, I think this is something that is seen everywhere when, when it moves to a very senior executive that things are coming through, we see the numbers dropping and we have seen that starting to increase and pick up now that Simbi is in post post and things are coming through to her. So what I have included in the paper, the board will be aware the plan was with the move of our long term guardian to EMAS into a new role. We wanted to take the opportunity to review the whole structure, particularly in light of the values, behaviours, work, culture work. And we agreed an interim appointment with the aim of then moving to permanent appointment for April next year. Due to COVID, we are not able to take forward that review work at the speed that we had originally hoped to. So what I have agreed with John and have done is to extend that interim appointment for a further six months to ensure that we can take that work forward solidly and that we have arrangements in place to make sure that Freedom to Speak Up is managed properly during that time. As Carolyn mentioned, we've seen a really positive increase in the response rate to the staff survey and are hoping that that reflects the ongoing improvement in the culture around speaking up. We're planning now with NHS e and I as critical friend how we make the most of that time when we get the, the data back from the survey to really then launch some work around freedom to speak up at that point. So very happy to take any questions, Chair. Thanks very much, Julie. Uh, you're snuck in EMAS in that, the East Midlands Ambulance Apologies. Service. <laughs> um, Alison, if I could bring you in, please. Hi, Th thanks, Julie. Um, uh, it's good to see that this is now getting some attention because it, it, we do need to improve, I think, on, both on the number of champions and, and, and the way that the Freedom to Speak Up is working. Um, you talk about training that's going across the organisation. I wonder whether the, you could include the non-execs in that? Yes, of course. OK, thank you. That was a straight, straightforward question and answer there, Alison. So uh, that's that's good to know. Um, I'm not seeing any other indications there. Um, I do think it's something that in terms of freedom to speak up, um, it would be really helpful, um, as you've described there, Julie, uh, if the uh, People and Quality Committee is keeping a, a, a close eye on this, yes. um, because I think a part of it is making sure that, um, that through those, this sort of transitional period and interim position and with the impact of COVID, that we aren't having anybody um, uh, falling through the gaps at all. Um, but OK, we will receive that report. And if we could um, now go to Adele um, for the quarterly security services report, which includes the uh, the, the, the regular nighttime confine, confinement uh, piece for us. Over to you, Adele. Hi, thank you. Um, this is a mandated report for the high secure services. So all high secure hospitals or three high secure hospitals have to have have to send this report to the board. Um, there's a couple of points I will take out of this report um, for firstly for awareness, approval and um, assurance. So um, each high secure hospital um, has to have an annual audit every single year to show that we are compliant with the security directions. Uh, this year, Rampton had their audit in October and I'm pleased to inform that we were we passed all the elements of the security audit and asked remain compliant. 
Um, and the second part is for approval from the board, and this is to request a continuation of the night confinement for patients at night. Great, thank you. Uh, I, I think I, I ask this question each time we come to that point, Dell. but um, if you could just confirm that um, night, night confinement is uh, used as infrequently as possible, but it's about uh, staff being able to do that in a way that is uh, held with board oversight. So night confinement is what we use within the hospital for um, patients um, overall overall however some patients if they are higher risk then we do not uh, confine them at night yes thank you thank you uh, any comments or questions colleagues on this uh, in which case could i please get an indication from you for that authorization we do need to make that formal for uh, adele to be able to go back from the board on this Thank you, I've got approval on that. Um, in which case, um, let's move if we can to the quality account. Anne Maria, over to you, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Anne Maria Newham. I'm the Executive Director of Nursing HPs and Quality, and I'm here to present the quality report for 2019 20. Uh, before I say anything about this, I just wanted to also say to the audience that um, this is not normal times that we've been through. Uh, normally, what you would do in January, February, you would um, consult widely, you would engage widely, and you'd have a lot of uh, conversations with various groups, both patients, carers, um, staff, governors, um, in respect of pulling together the quality report. So it reflects then what everybody has said and what everybody would like um, reflected within the um, uh, report. Um, however, January, February, all good plans were um, put to rest when we had COVID. And so therefore, uh, the quality report probably isn't as robust as we would have liked it to have been. But it does, um, what I'm um, presenting to you today is a really good reflection of the work that we did do in 2019-20. And it does give um, uh, an idea of what we would like to do going forward with regards to our quality priorities. Um, and also nationally, um, we could see that there was a lot of uh, conversation about how the quality report should be presented based on the fact that everybody was struggling with COVID. And so um, the regulations were amended, which meant there was no fixed deadline for providers to publish their 1920 equality account, which you normally get. So every year you get a very fixed date that you have to uh, produce, publish your quality account. So um, NHS England and NHS Improvement did recommend to providers that we uh, produce the report for the deadline of the 15th of December. So we have taken this to both our People and Quality Committee and we've had an extraordinary committee which Carolyn White has referred to in order to um, make sure that this is as robust as it possibly can be. However, the other thing I wanted to just say is in the light of COVID, uh, there has been no requirement this year for NHS Foundation Trusts to obtain an external assurance on the content of the quality report, which is what we would normally have to do. So um, the other thing was um, this was approved on the 24th of November by the People and Quality Committee. And so I'm presenting it here to you today for um, approval um, in its final uh, version. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Anne Maria. Um, and uh, again, in, invite any comments or questions. I'm not I'm not seeing them. I, I did just want to particularly um, draw attention to the uh, statement from Health Watch Nottingham and Health Watch Nottinghamshire, um, who gave positive feedback about the engagement within the communities and also um, about how we act upon advice, guidance and recommendations um, from service users and stakeholders. It's good to see that being recognised uh, by an external organisation uh, that is very, very focused on um, uh, patient and service user voices. 
Um, and 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 Maria, um, the the actual structure of the report, uh, my understanding is that um, a good chunk of this is that sort of laid down for us, and it they they don't always make for very easy read documents. Um, but a part of that is because we have to report in certain ways. Um, Correct. Yeah, but yeah. it's very formatted for us. About I would say about sixty to seventy percent of this report is dictated in the format of how you have to put it out. <coughs> Um, and also with regards to what they expect to be reported on. So there's very little new way in, in uh, what we can do innovatively or creatively almost. OK, thank you for that. So uh, colleagues, we're asked to give approval on this. Uh, and as Anne-Maria said, we can take assurance. And as Carolyn said earlier, uh, from the uh, quality uh, uh, people in quality committee review piece that have been done on that. So could you indicate if you're happy to give approval for the quality report, please? Thank you very much. Thank um, you. So we, we've not had any other notified urgent business. Um, as always, I'd just like to just take a moment to see if there's any reflections from colleagues about today's uh, today's meeting. Um, I know it's, it, it, it does reflect, I think, the um, the, the deliberate changed uh, pairing back a little of some of our governance uh, to enable um, the uh, the concentration on the pandemic. Um, so uh, I'll just see if there's any comments or questions. Uh, Manjit. Yes, thank you. Um, I think that we've had a really comprehensive meeting today. One of the areas that we haven't had mention of was just in relation to um, the impact of um, carers and relatives not being able to visit chair um, and how that's been managed in the organisation. I just wondered if any of the execs had any comment on that, understanding the um, the outbreak situation and the, uh, the, 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 um, the difficulties of allowing access safely, but just wanted to just get some feedback on that, please. Yeah, it's an important part of the whole conversation that we've had about responding to the um, uh, to the pandemic. So um, Julie H, do you want to start on that? Yes, please. So Julie Hankin, Medical Director. So this is something that the Clinical Reference Group, which sits across the whole trust managing these, keeps under constant review. We've had a very clear approach to we need to maintain visiting whenever possible, support and be really compassionate in how we manage it when we do have to restrict, but balance that with ensuring the safety of patients, their families and staff, obviously. So each area has separately been risk assessed and is within a pathway that sets out very clearly the level of risk for that area. And there's postage signage, information leaflets for families, around what that means therefore. So there are some areas where we've worked with families to identify a single member who will visit so that that maintains. There are others where they've, so we try to individualise the arrangements whenever possible and to make sure that it is facilitated. Uh, thanks for that, Julie. Uh, Anne Maria, did you want to add anything further to that? Um, well, I, I want to um, support what Julie's just said, but also to add that um, we have stopped visiting when there's been a COVID outbreak within a ward. Um, and we've done that for the safety of both the patients and the staff themselves. But I also wanted to let you know is that we've been congratulated by NHS England and NHS Improvement in respect of our mother and baby units, where we've made sure that uh, families have continued to be able to visit under difficult circumstances. And, um, and we've made sure we've risk assessed made sure that um, we've asked the questions the night before and people have still been able to visit. We've also followed national guidance on maternity and children's visiting as well. And all of the Hopewood, which is where our children and um, young people for mental health services, they continue to be able to have visitors throughout wave one and wave two. So we have accommodated, we've very risk assessed um, and we've made sure that it's been done on an individual basis as well. Thank you for that, Anne Maria. And uh, um, I understand that uh, also the Care Quality Commission and its Mental Health Act visits uh, has given positive feedback. And just to, just as a final point on this, Adele, do you just want to uh, explain um, part of Rampton's response, please? Absolutely, yes. Um, 
we within within the high secure services uh, we were unable to just use the ms teams like we are doing now uh, due to um, obviously high risk patients so we've adopted the purple visits which is a similar uh, what the similar process what they're using the prison service which has allowed our patients to have visits with their relatives um face to face like we are doing now it's gone down really well uh, we've had 44 visits since introduction and that is being booked daily and that's over a very long period so it's not now restricted to just nine to five they can do it in an evening and across we're sharing that across the division and we're also continuing with our carers events so we've had quite successful carers events on ms teams which has been really good great thank you for that um so just to just to see if there's any reflections on how today's meeting has gone from colleagues please uh Stephen, you've got a comment. Yes, um, well, well, first, Stephen Jackson, non-executive director. Uh, first of all, Paul, uh, well chaired as usual. Um, I, I think it's appropriate that we, we have adopted this, this pair down uh, approach to the board meeting today um, in, in the light of the circumstances that we face um, and uh, the pressures that uh, in particular the executive team are under. But, but nonetheless, I think we've, we've had a, a, a very thorough and well-written set of papers and, and I think we've covered all the main issues. So, uh, um, so, so I think it's been a, a, a positive meeting today and thank you. Thanks very much, Stephen. Uh, Sue, I'll come to you. Sue Nixon. Yes, thank, thank you, Paul. Sue Nixon, non-exec director. I would just echo those same comments that Stephen's just made. Um, particularly, as when you look at the agenda, there were some big chunky papers still in there um, and uh, about the quality account and the freedoms to speak up, as well as that very assured report that talked about Rampton and so on. So I thought we still had a pared down um, agenda, as Stephen has said, but actually we're still getting through the business that we're able to get through. Um, and I would agree, well chaired, and I hope everybody feels that they've had plenty of time to comment in terms of the, the quality of the reports. And I would also like to stress that um, Carolyn chaired uh, the extraordinary quality meeting particularly well, where we did go into the detail of the of the quality accounts because there are quite a few things in there that those people might uh, read and think, gosh, there's an awful lot that we still need to chase up. But um, I would wish to make um, a very clear commitment that we will be still continuing to look at all of those things through this next year. Great. Thanks very much. And John, I invite you to have the last word on this, please. Just the reflections today. Yeah, thank you. I, I, it, Sue, Sue said it already. I was going to make a point that I thought it was a good meeting, but uh, despite me thinking it's all going to be about COVID, um, there's an awful lot of content in there, which was um, some of the, the, the business of the organisation that we're continuing to get on with, whether it's um, redesigning, rebuilding the board assurance framework, the freedom to speak up, the provider collaboratives, etc. So um, I thought it, it was uh, a lot lots of business, wasn't entirely COVID and, um, and highlighted some of the good work that we're doing right across the board, thanks. Great, thank you very much. Um, so um, at that point, um, I'm going to um, just look with uh, slight, slightly horrified that our next meeting is in next year. Um, and um, uh, I'm afraid it's, it's, it's a little too early for me to, to, to wish best wishes for a new year, I, don't, I, I think, although I'm sure we'll all be relieved to get past this one. Um, so uh, colleagues on the board, if I suggest that we restart at 10 past 11 for our uh, part two meeting and a reminder that you need to go in via a different uh, MS Teams connection. And thank you to uh, anybody who's been observing us through this meeting. Thank you very much.